Thylacin. That is hello in the Tomashek language, spoken in the Sahara region. That is one hot place. And today we are discussing one hot encoding for sequential circuit designs. A one hot design means that exactly one of the flip flops in state memory will be high at any one time. Let's look back at the result of our previous design of a stoplight controller. This sequential circuit does not follow a one hot design because, in the case of a green light, both of the flip flops will be outputting low. In this video, we will redevelop the same stoplight controller but using a one hot design. It will have three key effects. First, it will eliminate the decoding logic for the outputs. For example, when the middle flip-flop is high, the yellow light turns on. The logic is direct. No decisions are needed. That's a benefit. Secondly, it will increase the number of flip-flops. We will need three flip-flops in this case because there are three possible states. That's a drawback. Thirdly, it will simplify the next state logic. This makes it easier for us wiring the circuit. But even better is that it improves the performance of the circuit by causing smaller fanout and shorter propagation delays. Let's get to it. Here is the exact same problem statement we saw before, but with one more bullet that explicitly says we must use one hot encoding. The impact on our state diagram is minimal. We have the same three states, green, yellow, red, and we have the same three arrows leaving each state emergency signal, timer signal, or neither. The only difference is the state codes. Here we see the state code for green is 001, for yellow is 010, and for red is 100. In other words, we have one hot encoding. Only the rightmost flip-flop will be high in the green state. Only the middle flip-flop will be high in the yellow state and only the leftmost for red. The state diagram leads directly to this next state table. By adding one more bit to our state codes, we have one more Q column. Here, it's Q2. And that means one more flip-flop instruction, T2. Note that every time we see state green, the three-bit code is 001. For state yellow, it is 010. And for state red, it is 100. Warning, what you are about to see may shock you. We have five present state columns, which means we need to use five input Carnot maps. We have not seen this yet in the course. I have purposefully limited problems to four inputs, but now it's time to venture beyond our comfort zone. It may look like these are two separate K-maps, but they are actually two layers of the same K-map, used to find the equation for t0. The top half is for the cases where q2 equals 0, and the other four inputs behave as you would expect on a four input map. The bottom half is the same, except it's for the cases where q2 equals 1. Let's look back at the bottom row of the next state table. The input code is 10010. Let's just parse that code to identify that q2 equals 1, and the remaining four bits are 0010. The output value for T0 is 0. Now, where do we place that output 0 on this K-map? First, Q2 equals 1, so we focus on the bottom half. The remaining four bits are 0010, which brings us to this square. There, we fill in the output 0. We can follow this procedure for every row in the next state table, which lets us fill in all the zeros and ones, like you see here. All the remaining squares are don't care conditions. That's a lot of X's. Previously, we would normally fill in the X's first and then fill in just the ones. In this case, it is easier to fill in both zeros and ones first, then backfill all the X's. Now to identify groups. Imagine these two layers stacked on top of each other. Squares can be vertically adjacent. This means, for example, that the bottom left corners of each half 
are adjacent with each other. First, let's identify the largest group that holds the most ones. That is this brown group of eight. Yes, it is just a single group, even though it has been sliced into two halves. The group of four in each half abides by the rules we are used to from four input maps. And those two halves are perfectly aligned vertically. The expression for this group is q1 prime and it with xt. Note that q1 is low at every square in this group, whether in the top or bottom half. Also, xt is high in every square. All other inputs change. This includes input q2, which is low up here, and high down there. Only a single one remains to group, and it is done most efficiently with this purple group of eight. The expression for this group is q0 anded with xe. The final equation from this map would be t0 equals qn prime and xt, or q0 and xe. With that one example, try your hand at finding the equations for t1 and t2. Pause the video while you do. Here are the three equations for the t inputs. If you struggled with using the 5 input k map, don't worry. We won't be using it very often in this course. I don't want you to miss the forest for the trees. The main point of this lesson is the meaning of a one-hot design, and the 5 inputs is just a consequence of that. Speaking of the one-hot design, the three output equations are as simple as can be. Each light matches the value of one of the flip-flops. For example, when Q2 is high, the red light is on. Let's compare the design equations from this one-hot design and our previous design. We have one more flip-flop instruction equation, but all of the equations are simpler. This takes us back to the three effects mentioned at the start of this video. Using one-hot encoding for state memory causes more flip-flops and associated equations. It generally makes those next state equations simpler, which leads to improvements in propagation delays and fanout. And it makes for simpler output logic, so simple in fact, that the flip-flop outputs feed directly as the output signals. Here we see the final circuit built from our equations. There is nothing new here, but there is one last little issue which would become apparent at startup. Can you spot it? In general, flip-flops need to be provided starting values. The only option with this particular device is to reset, which would force the state memory to read 0, 0, 0. The problem is that we haven't defined a state with that code. We have 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and 1, 0, 0, but not 0, 0, 0. With this particular set of equations, it so happens that the state memory jumps to one of the defined states with a flip of the clock. And once it locks in on a defined state, our design guarantees it will stay on track past that point. However, this was lucky. It could have worked out that the memory remains in an undefined state. Usually, we want to explicitly design to guarantee correct operations. There are a couple simple ways we could have done that here. One way is to add one more row to the next state table, which forces state code 000 to jump to a known state, perhaps a red light, on the next clock cycle. Another way is to use a flip-flop device that has a set port in addition to a reset port. If so, then our initializing switch could force a starting code of, say, 100, like you see here. Regardless of how you explicitly design it, it is important that you do so. The role of engineers is not to hope that something works, but to do whatever we can to ensure that it does work, preferably in an efficient manner. This requires understanding the broader design process, like we've covered the last couple weeks, as well as the more intricate pieces, such as whether to include a strobed output flip-flop, how to incorporate asynchronous switches, and whether a one-hot encoding scheme is suitable. 
there are no firm rules on these design decisions. Instead, as a student, you should expose yourself to many different techniques and gain a feel as to what works best in various situations.